Here's a nice little variety of British World War II rations. The Emergency Flying Ration Mark II. Air Ministry. Let's give this one a quick look. Not many of these in that kind of condition. Round Trees, York, England, Beech Nut Sweets. And here's the tube of Benzedrine. Pascal Barley Sugar. And then here is another one. Arranged differently. And that is because I restored this. This was an empty tin. The Emergency Ration. Just a bar of chocolate. Naval Action Ration. Pretty much just a small version of one of these. Without the Benzedrine, half as much of everything else. I restored this tin as well. It should have four Pascal barley sugars instead of three, but good enough. The tea ration came from the British mess tin ration, and it was a key open tin that fit inside of this. And this has a smaller container, actually. This is the one it fit in, and then it fit inside of this larger one and would close up. That also had corned beef, biscuits. This is from 1945, June 45. This came out of Cane, France. That is amazing. I got this for only 250 bucks, which is a, a terrific deal. It's unbelievable. I mean, this thing was like 400. This one was, again, restored. The tin was 50 bucks. I paid like, I think 450 for the Mark III. These are usually 200. This thing was like, I think only 150. These came out of a compo ration, composition ration. It's like a 10 in one, a 10 man, 24 hour ration. This is just a little extra bit I wanted to show before I start this video on something I pre-filmed like, I guess coming up two years ago now. We're gonna be checking out two different emergency rations used by the British Royal Air Force during World War II. The emergency flying ration Mark III and the emergency ration Type P. You can just barely see that under the key here. Now this one weighs 8.9 ounces or 250 grams. And the Flying Ration Mark III weighs 7.5 ounces or 213 grams. They were issued in the Bead and Flying Suit, Pattern May West Tropical Kit, and the Dinghy Kit, which the Dinghy Kit's an over-the-water survival kit. The Bead and Flying Suit, that thing had 10, maybe 12 different pockets, and each pocket would contain various items that a pilot would need. It's pretty much like a built-in survival kit. Now, both were mostly in-flight rations used to sustain pilots and gunners on long flying missions, but they were also escape and evasion or survival rations when no other food was available. Let's check them out. First, starting off with this Type P. Pull off this key. Lift that tab. Huh, that smells sweet and a little bit fruity. There's a waterproof bag. Then inside, Look at that. Yeah, that is so tightly packed in there that slowly but surely kind of making its way out there. I don't want to cut myself on the jagged, kind of sharp. Now these sardine cans, they're pretty thin metal. That smells delicious and a little bit rancid. This whole cloth strip. Six of those. And then, is this the same thing but just wrapped in cellophane? I'm not sure. It looks like it. Yeah. It's all peanut toffees. At least that's what I've read. What these are. There you go. That's the emergency ration type P, peanut toffees. 
and a waterproof bag and a strip of cloth. Cool. I think this thing costs like 220 pounds, but they're not common at all. All right, so then the waterproof bag for any loose components here. Some kind of old cellophane. This same waterproof bag is going to be in the Mark III, I believe, because down here they mention other components. Waterproof bag for rations. Unfold, slip strap to one side, and carefully extract your rations from tin to this bag. Close by folding top over several times. Slip strap back and tighten by holding end and easing buckle towards bag. Put in pocket. The bag will afford complete protection against water contact and will give limited protection up to several hours against immersion. To open, ease buckle away from bag. Handle with care. Emergency rations are designed to keep you going until you obtain other assistance. You are provided with food and water or the means to obtain water. Water is the prime necessity to maintain life and care of the water ration is of greatest importance. It should be preserved until really thirsty or used sparingly. Hold in your mouth for a time, gargle and swallow slowly. Give preference to drinking after eating. In the jungle, natural occurring water may permit modification to this but sterilize all water with the halazone purifying tablets provided before attempting to drink. Food provided will keep you going and relieve monotony. Energy tablets should be taken on instructions from the officer in command. Instructions are printed on carton. These are wrapped in cellophane. They're a little bit more protected. You would definitely need the bag for these just sitting out in the open. Gosh, I can't wait to try one of these, but I want to go over to the Mark III, and then once that's open, we'll tray it all up. So now for the emergency flying rash in Mark III. And these were used on bombing missions. Pilots and gunners would be awake for, you know, up to a couple days. And emergency flying rash in Mark II. This one's empty. It was reclosable. And a little bit thicker of metal. And I believe, because this thing was the exact same rash as this, I believe... This is a little bit cheaper and easier to produce. That sardine style tin. The Mark II has more metal to the tin. That reduction in metal and cost of production, that's the only difference. A non reclosable Mark III with a thinner metal and most likely a lot easier to mass produce. So now the Mark III. Hopefully it's okay. Looks like it was used as a hockey puck. Another waterproof bag, the same kind. This one I'm going to keep folded. Hey, look at that. Horlicks, I believe. Yeah, well, I just pulled that out, and now it, that was supposed to lift it this way. So now it's going to be a little difficult to remove this stuff. So this is like some old Horlicks breakfast. That's what I think it is. Horlicks breakfast malted milk powder, most likely. But they just used whatever scrap paper. And that I was supposed to pull up on both ends so this could get released easier. But when all else fails... Oh, that was easy. So you get single, what I believe could be treacle candies or some kind of malted milk chew and I believe it's the latter. These tablets will stimulate physical and mental reserves, overcome feelings of fatigue, stave off depression, low spirits, and apathy, ward off sleep, and promote keenness and will to survive. If the conditions are very severe or there seems to be little hope of holding out for more than a few hours, Start the tablets at once, giving one at sunrise, midday, and sunset. If the conditions are not so bad and there's a chance of holding out for days, 
Reserve the tablets and only begin them when exhaustion is setting in. The tablets should not be given to wounded men, neither should they be given to excitable or hysterical men, or those whose minds are wandering. The tablets would make them worse. Energy tablets, 20 tabs, to be opened only on instructions from the officer in command. Benzedrine sulfate. Look at that, Pascal barley sugar. They're starting to liquefy. Some chewing gum. So there's everything. And here's the type P. This is essentially your main source of sustenance, the type P. Okay, so there's everything laid out. The type P and the Mark III. That's looking pretty good. All right, so let's get this out on to a tray. Nice, okay, so let's first start off by checking out a peanut toffee. Yeah, it smells a little bit fruity and rancid. Hmm. Wow. Oh. It's going through the phase, it's right there. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's rancid. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's like a super. That will just coat your throat and your mouth with this film of um, like a really. Oh, it's just rancid oils. I mean, it's like that every time, there's just varying degrees. It's easy to chew. Still has kind of a nice flavor. It's just, it feels like it's making my mouth swell. And the level of rancidity is just a bit too much for me to keep going. Like, unfortunately, I mean, whoa. Really, these things, this is where you'd be getting the majority of your actual nutrition. Over the flying ration Mark II or Mark III, that's just predominantly sugar and, you know, amphetamine. So that's, I mean, if you're a, a bomber pilot or something like that, you're having to go on, you know, long flight missions, something like that. Amphetamines were a huge part of fueling the soldier of World War II. The Germans, Americans, British and Japanese all used it. With the Germans, I mean, during the Blitzkrieg of 1939, 29 million of what they dubbed attack pills were issued in 1939 alone. The Germans used over 200 million Pervitin pills from 1939 to 1945. Benzedrine sulfate, the British, they used about 74 million, or well, were issued. Here are 20 right here that weren't used. The US, I mean, American soldiers, 15% of them were using amphetamine during the war, and 250 million were issued. I mean, that's astounding. Yeah, these um, little wrapped candies from the Mark III. Double wrapped in wax paper. It's still wrapped in paper a little bit. Hmm. It's very chewy, lightly sweet, bitter. It stimulates your saliva glands. It's definitely some kind of malted milk candy, but much less sugar than, say, the malted milk tablets in, you know, U.S. rations of World War II. Yeah, it's almost like an unsweetened caramel or malted milk caramel chew. Such an unusual flavor. 
I love these. Wow. They didn't spoil. Yeah. These. These are actually really good. It's perfect. It hasn't gotten hard as a rock or anything. A lightly sweet, moderately bitter malted milk chew. Too bad about these. I mean, I don't know, like, I want to try a different piece. That one's like dark and weird. Yeah, they're all rancid. So now for this Pascal barley sugar. That is one of the most delicious things. I mean, it reminds me of candy corn, but molasses flavored. Wow, look at that. That is amazing. This will give you a quick pick me up. These you can eat slowly. The chewing gum, great for when you're up in the air. Gives you something to chew on, eases stress and tension. I don't want to eat the plastic part. My apologies. So, all right. So then the chewing gum, one of these opened up and kind of just busted open. Just try one piece. Hey, it bites right in. It's not hard as a rock and a little bit brittly. I'm going to take these and set them in this tin for now. That chewing gum reduced down to like nothing the gum base there's not much of it it's mostly sugar the energy tablets now i'm not going to take any of these but i will present the component let's see what it's looking like Twenty energy tablets. Take only as instructed by officer in command. Okay, we're back with that can of cigarettes used by the RAF, also part of the ten in one compo ration. And then that twenty four hour ration, or the tin ration, or a couple different names. T. All right, let's get this out on the tray. Nice. Okay, let's first start off by. Checking out that tea. No hiss. Whoa. Oh, man. Putrid. It's unbelievable. The dried milk in there, I was really was hoping there wasn't going to be dried milk in there, and there is. Cronobacter sakazaki. That's the bacteria that grows in this. It can grow in dried foods like powdered milk, infant formula and whatnot. Even tea and starches. Yeah, anyone can get sick with it, but especially infants. And this, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna like, I don't know. I want to get it out of here. I got to put this in a bag. Hold on one sec. Oh, man. I just came back in here. The entire room smells like it. Like, I know my limit. And strep will grow in a gallon of milk, you know, and it swells up. All right. I got to get this out of the room. That is, I'm telling you, when dairy goes bad, it's like, I might put that under a microscope.
Last time I got sick with old dried milk was in 2014. And it was from a British ORP that was like four or five years old at the time. That was it. It wasn't even that old. All right, let's open this up. Give you the sweats. Vomiting. Diarrhea. Wow, look at this tape. Dude, that was satisfying. All right, so like this tape, I want to reattach it. Oh, wow. Those look pretty dry. For 10 guys for one day, five cigarettes each. Don't look that great. Oh wow. Capstan Navy Cut Medium. W D and H O Wills. Let's see if there's one that doesn't have a bunch of stains on it. I, I bet they're all the same, but how about one at the center? Moisture got into this. I mean, it's one of those things where I think there's dry mold in this. Oh, look, there was rust that got in. These aren't going to be good. They don't smell that great. It barely even smells like tobacco. Hold on, let me just go grab another can of cigarettes. I got like some from the 1800s. Might need a stunt smoke here. Cause this one, I'm probably just gonna put, I'm just gonna put this back in the tin and reseal it. Cause these are unsmokable. I can taste the mold in this on the dry pull. And it's disgusting. I'm not gonna do that to myself. Like, you gotta actually enjoy the smoke. My apologies, but this is just gonna get resealed. I can still use this for display, and it's not bad. All right, so we've seen the R R I C R C I ration individual combat ration combat individual. These are my oldest. This is from 1886, approximately. Now, 1885 is their newest award. 17 prize medals, Woodbine. This one says 1897. You see, this is in between 1885 and 1897. Those ration cigarettes were WD and HO Wills. These are my other two tins from that same company. These are military. They're issued Her Majesty ships only, Navy military issued cigarettes if they're duty free that means they're you know tax exempt wild woodbine cigarettes by wd and ho wills bristol and london cigarettes are made in england every genuine package of wild woodbine cigarettes has the signature thus wd and ho wills they were founded in 1786 and they closed up in 1988 absolute oldest is 1897 i would guesstimate circa 1900 let's go ahead and check it out whoa nice hiss what that was that was really something that's some thin metal just astounding look at that that is like nothing I've smelled before for tobacco those are beautifully aged and preserved 120 year old or so tobacco like cigarettes that are just these are the most beautiful cigarettes I've ever smelled and seen Wild Woodbine, WD and HO Wills. The way they smell, I wish you could 
can't even, I mean, the, there, that was a hermetically sealed tin. It was, it was perfect. And look at this. I mean, that is, it's like a kind of thick cardboard. Her Majesty ships only. Hmm. <laughs> That's the most flavorful, unfiltered, like sweet dried fruit. Cherry, currant, and dark chocolate is what that tastes like. Like a, a, a medley of dried fruit and chocolate. Let's go ahead and smoke one of these. Yeah, that's really something. That dry pole is like nothing else I've ever had. I've never tasted that kind of complexity of fruit and chocolate in tobacco. I mean, I've, I've come across like maple and fig, cedar and gardenias, you know, varying floral notes and maple again. Nothing like this. I got some tea, just a bag of regular tea. War One, that's what this is, or Boer War. This is the oldest cigarette I've ever smoked. It's well over 100 years old. It's so smooth, it's unbelievable. That is, that is one of the greatest cigarettes I've ever had. I mean, that is, it's strong too. I'm feeling it right off the bat. The two drags in, this thing's, um, ooh. fought in Northern Africa or heh, defending Malta. That was a good one. They were defending Malta from the Italians. Italians were invading Malta and there was a food shortage defending Malta. They were ordered on by Lord Gort. Lord Gort governed um, the rations. Ordered to a handful of bully beef, some bread and biscuits. I mean, that's a half iron ration right there. At one point, they were so low on food, they were having to bring in yeast on submarines. Desert war. North Africa, Libya, and Egypt. The tank war going on. And that's when the combo rations were first used. There were observers that, American observers, in the Northern Africa campaign that checked out those Ten and ones, and that is where the U.S. ten and one and five and one and whatnot originally five and one turned into ten and one, which was just a box of two five and one rations. And so when you check out a five and one small detachment or ration small detachment five persons, it originates from the British combo ration. There are ten man rations, and you know it requires cooking and whatnot, and they're still used. all the time get a real flavor of it I'll say this the way it smells is where all the flavor is it's like that dry folds it's like fruit currant chocolate the way it tastes it's just lightly sweet with a full flavored tobacco it's not harsh at all I mean it's not harsh at all it is incredible I mean I've I haven't had a cigarette like this. Actually, I think this is this and the, that five in one pack of candles. These are the best. This is really up there. I'd have to say it could potentially be even better than those candles. Malta from 1940 to 42. It was malnutrition in Malta. Led to sand fly fever, is what they called it. 
if you don't eat enough, that's, that's how you get sick. One of the ways it lowers your immune system, and that led to dysentery. It's like old wars where half the, or more than half of the casualties weren't from combat, but from disease. And those kind of logistical nightmares really lowers the capability, the fighting capability of, of the soldier. Stays lit too. Man. I don't even know what to say. I'm at a loss for words on this one. Getting lost in the complexity of this incredible cigarette. I mean, it is just. Anyway, North Africa, they were rationed to six pints of water a day. That's not enough water in the desert. And a lot of times you're only getting four pints of water a day. It's pretty rough, to say the least, especially if you're washing your clothes or having to get that sand and there are sandstorms, fleas, and dust, and, and just it sucks the moisture out of you. You're trying to go to sleep and it's in between your toes. How are you going to wash that off when you only get four pints of water in a day? You don't. You just got to live with it. You got these blisters and everything. Lips are chapped. This is the best cigarette I've ever had. I mean, just a little bit of tobacco at the end. It's not even doing that typical loose, dry tobacco at the tip. Nothing like that. Two years living off bully beef, the Irish soldier. Two years of bully beef and canned vegetables or beef stew, biscuits, vitamin C tablets and that canned tea, those little tins. A lot of times throughout World War II, British, I mean, along with famine, what happens? You have desperation, you would have soldiers going and stopping at a farm or, you know, um, if they were lucky, there would be like a bakery or something. Most of the time when fruit and vegetables, which were a luxury, would hit the front lines, they'd be spoiled. That was another thing. So, again, those vitamin C tablets were like lime juice, dried lime juice, you know, powdered. That's how they were getting vitamin C to prevent scurvy and further illness. You're in a trench, whether this was the Boer War, World War I, or you're in a foxhole in World War II, something like this give you a little taste of home. That tea was the most important thing for those guys, having a nice mug or mess cup, you know, huddled together in a foxhole or what have you, gathering their warmth, keeping their sanity. It's the only normalcy that you'll have is that food and those hunger pangs. It was common. They dealt with a lot of hunger and a lot of pain. Imagine, you know, if they're having to take Benzedrine on top of it. I mean, that ward off hunger, but what follows with it. You know, that stuff wears off, and I'll bet you these guys were going crazy. There's just a whole other issue. And they're coming home with new habits. Camera cut off, and this thing just went out. It was the misjudged landing in Arnhem, September 1944. Those guys were only given two days worth of rations on the airborne landing. And that was supposed to last them a week. I mean, at least German farms, once they were in there, they were pretty rich with resources. This goes back to like Roman times, the same kind of thing, foraging off of the land because you don't have what you need. And you know, you're catching a chicken or a farm or you're stopping at a bakery and just kind of getting what you can there. The, the Romans, Spartan soldiers having to hunt and forage. It's like there's no difference there. Now, this is why rations these days are so incredible. Because logistically we can produce them fast, we know the cost, we know what ends up happening. The whole world knows through history. The world knows for whatever future wars or current wars or what have you, wars we've been in the last 50 years, we know from previous the cost of not having shelf stable food that lasts. It's one of those things that hopefully 
we'll never have to deal with again. I mean, war is bad enough, but then having famine and whatnot along with it just makes it so much worse. Anyway. There's been a hard-learned realization over the years that a properly fed soldier is nourished not by mere macronutrients, but from vitamins and minerals as well. A lot of times they would be supplemented directly into the food like this emergency ration. This is supplemented with thiamine or vitamin B1. And a B1 deficiency is what leads to beriberi, interesting name. It's a neurological disease. When ox-driven wagons delivered scoff rations to troops during the Boer War, and scoff stands for Senior Catering Officer Field Force, those rations were in a, a little box and it contained a pound of biscuits, 12 ounces of corned beef, three ounces of sugar, four ounces of jam, six of an ounce of pepper, about a half ounce of tea, and if they were lucky, some fresh vegetables. Also, if they were lucky, they'd get something like this. South Africa, 1900. I wish you a happy new year, Queen Victoria. The tin itself was made by Hudson Scott and Sons in Carlisle. It's not marked. Fry. Fry was one of three chocolate companies that produced the chocolate for this tin. They were the only one that put their name on the chocolate. Not going to eat any of it. The tin foil has broken down. The chocolate's absorbed tin, and it wouldn't be safe to eat. Gosh, look at that. Look at all those little crystals. That's metal. Queen Victoria had these produced specifically for soldiers as a little New Year's morale boost. Fried chocolate, Cadbury, and Roundtree all made the chocolate. None of them were pro-war. They didn't even want to make any money off it. They didn't want to be producing chocolate and making money. Let's look at this one more time. They didn't want to be caught producing and selling chocolate making money off of the war. So Cadbury and Roundtree, they decided not to put their name on the chocolate. Fry decided to. About 100,000 of those tins were sent. Not many of them left. It's kind of like this one. But Roundtree actually marked it because it's not controversial. It's just the King's Coronation Crystal Palace 1911. And this isn't a ration, but it's still cool to see. Let's check this out real quick. Some old, incredibly old chocolate. Oldest chocolate I own right here and that over there. Look at this. Round Tree and Company. Gosh, it smells bad. I can smell it from up here. It just smells like metal and like some kind of rancid fat. Just like a rancid oil and metal. I actually don't know if I smelled this one yet. That smells like, smells like a library and like leather. It smells like a paper, leather. It doesn't smell like chocolate at all. But anyway, many times the scoff rations that were delivered by ox driven wagons. A lot of times those supply lines would be cut off. Like at the Siege of Ladysmith, November 1899 to the end of February the following year. Once they ran out of food, they ate their horse. It was tough and it smelled pungent when they cooked it. When they ran out of horse, they had the rocks and the ones that were pulling their wagons, they had to eat those. Trek ox is what they called it. They harvested wild spinach off the land and they were down to one sixth of an ounce of tea. Now this was at Ladysmith, again, and they were down to two and a half biscuits a day. And that led to dysentery, primarily. They also were getting enteric fever, which that was from poisoned or untreated water. In World War I, their, their field ration was a little bit better. 
not by much, and that's if they could get the full ration. There were food shortages throughout, especially when German submarines were taking out supply boats in 1917. That resulted in a national food shortage. The Emergency Ration Field Service Nineteen eight. The British soldier, whether they'd served in the Second Boer War, World War I, or World War II, they'd been issued field rations with groundbreaking, shelf-stable packaging. Rations like these. They led to better things. And to conclude this video, this one was a little bit different. I'm gonna enjoy these. I'll put this inside of another container. Save these for another time. So that was a fascinating look into British survival rations used by the Royal Air Force, a tin of compo ration cigarettes, which too bad the compo ration cigarettes weren't good, but this was a nice substitute and a, a beautiful surprise. What an experience. Well, anyway, this is Steve1989. I hope you liked the video. And I'll be coming back at you with something new. We're old. All right, cool. See ya.